Hello, um, my name is Fuad Baroudi, and I am a professor of otolaryngology at neck surgery at the University of Chicago. And as part of the video textbook Rhinology Worldwide, I will be presenting to you a uh, portion of a chapter on allergic rhinitis, uh, which discusses epidemiology, clinical presentation, and diagnosis. I have nothing to disclose. Um, what we will go over here is a brief introduction, and then I will discuss epidemiology, disease burden, uh, the clinical presentation of the disease, including a physical exam, and then diagnostic uh, testing, which includes skin testing, uh, detection of serum-specific IgE, and other diagnostic methodologies. Um, at the end, we will go over brief conclusions and key points and a list of suggested reading and the sources for the presentation. As an introduction, allergic rhinitis is a very common disorder. So although benign, it has a significant negative impact on quality of life and economic productivity, thus its importance. And we will go over uh, the following as mentioned in the slide. Let's start by talking about epidemiology. There's a couple of studies that are relatively recent that have looked at the prevalence and the incidence of allergic rhinitis. One of them is the Isaac study or the International Study of Asthma and Allergies in Childhood, included data from 236 centers in 98 countries and included about 257,000 school children ages six to seven years and almost a half million children ages 13 to 14 years. And the prevalence rate for rhinitis varied between 0.8 and 14.9% with a medium of about 6.9% in kids six to seven years old. And in older kids, 13 to 14, the prevalence varied between 1.4 to 39.7% with a median of 13.6%. The highest prevalence was in Western Europe, North America and Australia. And the lowest rates were in Eastern Europe, South and Central Asia. In general, prevalence rates increased over time. And if you look at the 12 month prevalence rate on median, it was 8.5% in children aged six to seven and 14.6% in 13 to 14 year olds. So the prevalence of rhinitis increased over a relatively short period of time. And that was mostly in westernized countries with a high standard of living. We have noticed this in multiple other settings that the prevalence of allergic diseases is increasing, including that of allergic rhinitis. This is another study looking at German children following about 2,800 German children from ages nine to 11 till the ages of 15 to 18, same children. And the incidence of allergic rhinitis increased from 7% to 14% as these children got older. And the data suggests that the incidence of allergic rhinitis increases significantly as children grow from childhood into adolescence. Another example of that rise we talked about earlier. Um, this is a survey for adults. This is the European Community Health Survey. This was conducted in 35 centers in 15 countries, which included countries from Europe, Australia, and the United States. And the prevalence of allergic rhinitis in people aged 20 to 44 ranged from 11.8 in Oviedo, Spain, to 46% in Melbourne, Australia. So clearly a wide range of prevalences across the globe. Um, if you look at the, the US NHANES survey, um, it was between 2005 and 2006, the US, that survey was targeted towards prevalence of diseases such as allergic rhinitis, and the 12 month prevalence of rhinitis was 23.5% in that re uh, report. 31.3% uh, was the prevalence in patients ranging 40 to 49 years of age. And for the group as a whole, 24% had seasonal rhinitis and about only 10% had perennial rhinitis. So seasonal was the more prevalent presentation. Allergic rhinitis in general is more common on a, in males before puberty and females after puberty. And these differences are more pronounced in those with asthma and allergic rhinitis concomitantly, an important point to keep in mind. 
let's discuss disease burden. So disease burden hinges around quality of life and economic burden. So uh, we know for a fact that allergic rhinitis is not just a nasal problem. It's associated with fatigue, daytime sleepiness, daily activity impairment, reduced work productivity, impaired cognitive functioning, reduced learning abilities, impaired sleep, and impaired disease-related quality of life. These are all been supported and documented over the years with multiple well-done studies. Uh, this is an example of a study done by Eli Meltzer. This is the Pediatric Allergies in America survey, and they surveyed the parents of, of patients with allergies or controls. And when you look at the panel on the left at patient's productivity score, you will see that patients with no symptoms had very high productivity at 97%, and patients with symptoms at their worst had productivity that was reduced by about 30%. And if one looked at parental perception and compared the column in red for the patients with allergies compared to the column in blue for the patients without allergies, and if you look at attributes such as my kid accomplished less or cut down on the amount of stuff that they did, or had difficulty in performing different tasks, or they were limited in the kind of work or other activities, you see consistently that more allergic kids than non-allergic kids had problems with these domains, suggesting a significant negative impact on productivity and quality of life. If you look at other um, domains, uh, when parents asked about negative effects on allergies, organized sport or exercising, outdoor activities, going out playing with friends, having pets, doing well in school, doing things with family, school activities, indoor activities. Again, much more impairment in the patients with allergies compared to the patients without allergies. And this is impact on sleeping, uh, difficulty in getting to sleep, waking up during the night, suggesting poor sleep and lack of a good night's sleep. Again, many more uh, parents of children with allergies perceived this to be a problem compared to the children without allergies. Uh, this is a typical quality of life questionnaire. Uh, it is, this is the Juniper quality of life questionnaire administered to controls and patients with rhinitis. And the domains are targeted towards sleep, non-respiratory symptoms, practical problems, nasal problems specifically, eye symptoms, emotions, activities, and overall quality of life consistently and significantly, you will notice that the patients with rhinitis had lower quality of life than patients without rhinitis. Uh, this is disease burden relating to sleep. Um, there's lack of a good night's sleep in 78% of patients with rhinitis, unable to get to sleep in 75% and waking up during the night at about 64%. So again, significant negative impact on sleep in patients with allergies and rhinitis symptoms. What about the economic burden? So this is not just a problem with quality of life. It's also an economic burden. And when you look at some metrics, allergic rhinitis ranks fifth among chronic conditions in the United States. And estimates of the annual direct cost of allergic rhinitis ranges from 2 billion to 5 billion, with more than half coming from prescription medications and the rest from physician office visits, lab tests, and immunotherapy. Compared with matched controls, patients with allergic rhinitis have an almost two-fold increase in medication costs and a 1.8-fold increase in visits to a healthcare provider. Important uh, productivity-related issues and uh, important economic burdens. In a survey of over 8,000 US employees at 47 employer locations, 55% reported allergic rhinitis symptoms for an average of 52 days per year. They were missing 3.6 days of work per year because of allergic rhinitis. They were unproductive 2.3 hours per workday when symptomatic. And the mean total productivity losses, which included absent from work and being at work not being very productive, which is called presenteeism, calculated at about $593 per employee per year. Not a trivial amount. In the US, allergic rhinitis results in about 3.5 million lost work days and 2 million lost school days annually. Again, very important numbers to keep in mind. This is an interesting study. This is a study of 634 service representatives at Bank One call center in Elgin, Illinois. 
And um, it looked at allergy-related presenteeism, uh, and it measured it by the amount of time workers spent on each of the calls that they were tasked of responding to. And when you look at during the peak ragweed pollen season, the allergy sufferers productivity fell 7% below the productivity of coworkers without allergies. Uh, and ragweed wasn't causing a problem. The two groups productivity levels were about the same. And if you look at the graph on the right, when there were no symptoms, productivity was almost the same between control and diseased. And as pollen counts increased, productivity decreased for a peak of about 7% reduction in productivity compared to non-allergic peers. Very important point uh, made in that study. Let us now discuss clinical presentation. I think I've convinced you that uh, allergic rhinitis is prevalent, uh, leads to significant impact on quality of life in a negative way, and also a significant economic burden, uh, at least in studies done in the United States. Um, and now we're going to talk about clinical presentation. So when a patient comes to see me in clinic with allergic rhinitis, it is very important to look at the type of symptoms experienced. What are the symptoms that cause most of the problem? Is it congestion? Is it a runny nose? Is it eye symptoms? I ask the patients about timing, duration, and frequency of symptoms, relationship to environmental exposure to try to figure out a pattern for what the type of allergy might be. I ask about exposure to pollen during environmental seasons and exposure to pets, dust, other things. Uh, I always question patients as part of the history taking about comorbid conditions. Asthma is very common. Rhinosinusitis is very common. Sleep disordered breathing or sleep disturbances such as obstructive sleep apnea are commonly seen. And it's important to ask about family history of atopic disorders as there seems to be more likelihood of patient being allergic if mom or dad or siblings are allergic themselves. And finally, now that a lot of the allergy medications are over the counter, I ask about what medications have you used and how have you responded uh, to these medications? And uh, these are typically over-the-counter and or potential prescription medications that they might have received from other practitioners. This is an example of, from the Pediatric Allergies in America survey, looking at the typical symptoms and the respondents who complained of these symptoms. And what you'll see is orange is they complained about it most days and uh, red is they com you know, complained about that specific complaint every day. So an important part. And you see that nasal congestion uh, is the most frequently mentioned complaint followed by repeated sneezing, runny nose, watery eyes, post-nasal drip, Riching, uh, red itchy eyes, nasal itching, dry cough, unable to sleep or difficulty with that, headache, facial pain, and ear pain is being the least. So this gives you a flavor for the most commonly cited complaints. If you look at the most bothersome allergy symptoms, when both children and parents were asked, what is it about your allergies that bothers you most? You will see that nasal congestion wins both with the parents and with the children. About a quarter mentioned this as their most bothersome allergy symptom, followed by headache, runny nose, repeated sneezing, red itchy eyes, dry cough, post-nasal drip, watery eyes, ear pain, nasal itching, facial pain. And some of the respondents were not quite clear on what really bothers them most. But you can see predominantly nasal congestion wins as the most bothersome of these symptoms. Additional symptoms that we ask and that are present in patients with allergic rhinitis are a decreased sense of smell or poor sense of smell, snoring or sleep disordered breathing, commonly also in children, wheezing or coughing to suggest asthma. And then in general, 96% of patients present with two or more of these symptoms. And it is well known now that patients with perennial or chronic rhinitis tend to report more congestion than patients with seasonal allergies who tend to complain more about itchy, sneezy, runny type symptoms. How do you classify uh, these uh, presentations? There's a couple of classifications. There's the ARIA classification, which is allergic rhinitis and its impact on asthma classification has been primarily spearheaded by Dr. Jean Bousquet from France and has uh, 
uh, experts from all across the globe, and they discuss intermittent and persistent. And intermittent, if you have the symptoms less than four days per week um, or less than four weeks a year. Persistent, you have symptoms more, uh, four or more days a week and more than four weeks a year. And then when you think about these symptoms, uh, mild, moderate to severe, mild is normal sleep, normal daily activities, normal work and school, no troublesome symptoms. This goes towards mild disease, be it persistent or intermittent. And moderate to severe disease, you have abnormal sleep, impairment of daily activities, problems caused at work from the uh, allergic rhinitis and troublesome symptoms. So if you have one of these, then you're more moderate uh, to severe in category. And that's how uh, many clinicians now characterize uh, their patient's allergic rhinitis. Uh, the older classification, which is still adopted by the most recent set of guidelines published by the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, is seasonal, which occurs during specific seasons, perennial, where symptoms occur continuously, and they could have seasonal exacerbations or they could be without seasonal exacerbation. And then a category labeled as episodic allergic rhinitis where symptoms are elicited by sporadic exposure. Typical example of episodic rhinitis is a patient who's allergic to pets who does not live with pets, but presents to a home with pets and gets significant symptoms. And you can, as a clinician, classify your patients in using either of these categories. Let's talk a little bit about the physical exam. Uh, it's not unusual to have significant mouth breathing because of nasal obstruction. There's nasal itching, and this presents as the transverse supratip crease because one uh, clears their nose very frequently, which is referred to as the allergic salute, which you see on the picture on the right. Patients with throat clear because of postnasal drainage. They might have periorbital edema or allergic shiners, as seen in the picture below. Uh, which is dark discoloration of the lower lids related to nasal congestion. Uh, if one checks the ears, there might be symptoms of eustachian tube dysfunction and retraction of the eardrum, and sometimes mid-ear fluid due to significant nasal congestion. And clearly the eyes will have redness and excessive tearing, and uh, some patients will be itching their eyes also in the office. Um, when you look at the nose, you have inferior turbinate hypertrophy. The Nasal mucosa is typically congested edematous, and it's pale bluish, which is pretty consistent with allergic rhinitis. But sometimes you see the mucosa not necessarily being pale and bluish, and the patients still have allergic rhinitis. Rhinorrhea is typically clear and not purulent. And uh, uh, nasal endoscopy is only necessary to evaluate for concurrent polyps or chronic rhinosinusitis. And the picture at the bottom right shows you an example of a right nasal cavity with a very congested turbinate touching the nasal septum, thus obstructing passage of breathing, and with clear secretions and pale nasal mucosa, which is typical of allergic rhinitis. Let's move now to talking about how you establish the diagnosis of allergic rhinitis. Um, I will tell you that uh, this is uh, taken from the guideline, uh, the clinical practice guideline published for the uh, uh, by the American Academy of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery in 2015, uh, that radiology is really not recommended or necessary as part of the workup of allergic rhinitis. It might be necessary if one is uh, wanting to evaluate associated rhinosinusitis, but there is really no role for getting any type of radiologic studies in working up the diagnosis of allergic rhinitis. Uh, when uh, that's another point from the guideline, is that clinicians should make the clinical diagnosis of allergic rhinitis when patients present with a history consistent with the disease and a physical examination that are consistent with an allergic cause. And the typical um, symptoms would be congestion, runny nose, itchy nose, or sneezing. And the physical exam would be clear rhinorrhea, congestion, pale mucosa, and red watery eyes. So what this basically is telling you is a patient presents to the office with typical symptoms in response to typical exposure uh, in their locale during a certain pollen season, then you can presume that they have uh, allergic rhinitis and you can treat them as such without necessarily uh, doing a skin test to find out what they are allergic to. Uh, 
testing um, is reserved for when patients with a clinical diagnosis to differentiate allergic from non-allergic for patients who do not respond to typical therapy when you want to know what they're allergic to and give them more recommendations when the diagnosis is uncertain when knowledge of the specific causative allergen is needed to target therapy or avoidance such as uh, patients who live with pets it's important to know whether they're allergic to the pets to know what to recommend to them and clearly if one is thinking about allergen immunotherapy you need to do skin tests to know exactly what you are dealing with and target your therapy to that agent or allergen uh, let's talk about skin prick testing so sensitivity and specificity are pretty reasonable about 80 percent and typically, the clinician will use a panel representing an appropriate geographical profile of allergens that a patient would routinely be exposed to. And that's what most people do routinely in their offices. Uh, always, uh, there should be a positive control, which is usually histamine, and a negative control, which is glycerin or saline. Uh, allergen extracts should be used only if standardized. And very commonly utilized areas in the body is the forearms and the back, depending on the number of tests you are doing. And the tests should be applied about two centimeters apart so that if you have a big wheel or flare reaction, you don't mix as to what it is related to. Um, and there are single lancet or multiple lancet devices for these skin prick tests, and they limit skin penetration depth to about one millimeter. And uh, this is an example of a single lancet, you see it, it is really not very painful. You dip this in a tray that has the allergen, then you use it to perform the skin prick test. And these are um, uh, multiple lancet devices that you can dip in wells that have the different allergens that are standardized. And then you can use it to do, this is an example of a forearm where you can do up to eight or six uh, tests or up in this case, up to 10 tests at the same time. And these would include the positive and the negative control. And you see the typical wheel that would did, you would anticipate from a positive test or a positive control. Results are usually read within 15 to 20 minutes by measuring the greatest wheel diameter. And a wheel three millimeters or larger than the negative control is considered positive. Uh, important for these tests uh, that the patient cannot be on an antihistamine anywhere from two to seven days, depending on the half-life of the antihistamines. Um, and there is always a small risk of systemic reaction and might be a little uncomfortable for children, although it is not that big of a deal. Uh, it cannot be performed in patients with certain conditions of the skin, such as dermatographism or atopic dermatitis, because in, it can irritate the skin quite a bit in those situations. Intradermal testing may be used as a primary testing modality or as a secondary test following skin prick testing. Uh, a short bevel of a needle is used to inject 0.02 milliliters of allergenic extract into the superficial dermis to produce a four millimeter diameter wheel. And it's also used primarily by otolaryngic allergy as a method to determine the starting point for allergen immunotherapy. Uh, there are no studies that have demonstrated a clear benefit of quantitative intradermal testing over single intradermal testing with regard to the diagnosis of clinical allergy or the outcome of specific immunotherapy. Again, after instilling the wheel, you read the reaction in about 15 to 20 minutes. And as usual, you compare to negative and positive controls. What about serum total IgE testing? Uh, serum total IgE offers the possibility of suspecting atopic status in a wide screen, but low levels do not exclude allergy, and therefore evidence does not support the routine use of total IgE in the diagnosis of allergic rhinitis. More importantly, you need serum antigen-specific IgE if you will do a serum test, and uh, you submit the serum to enzymatically driven reactions produce, that produce a chemiluminescent colorimetric or fluorometric reaction quantified by an autoanalyzer. The intensity of the reaction is proportional to the amount of specific IgE in the serum, and sensitivity goes between 67 and 96 percent, and specificity varies between 80 and 100 percent. There is an excellent correlation with both nasal provocation testing and skin prick testing in the diagnosis of allergic rhinitis. These tests are safe. It's a blood draw with no untoward uh, side effects. 
and can be an alternative for patients who cannot tolerate skin prick testing for a variety of reasons. And it does not require the need to avoid ongoing medications such as antihistamines uh, when one does the test. So you can basically draw the blood at any time. Results of allergy testing should be taken in the context of clinical disease in general, be it serum test or skin test. There are patients with positive tests who have absolutely no symptoms on exposure of the allergens and therefore should not be labeled as having clinical allergic rhinitis. They're atopic and they have sensitivity to certain allergens, but these do not lead to symptoms. There are also patients with typical symptoms who have negative skin testing or specific IgE levels. And these patients recently have been described as having uh, what we call local allergic rhinitis. And uh, this is a disease entity uh, where patients are usually given the diagnosis of idiopathic visomotor or non-allergic rhinitis because they have typical symptoms, but you test them um, and they have no evidence of IgE-related disease. Many of these may have local allergic rhinitis, which is characterized by the presence of a localized allergic response in the nasal tissues and not necessarily elsewhere in the body with local production of specific IgE and a positive response to nasal provocation without evidence of positive skin prick test or serum specific IgE elevation. This can affect up to 45% of patients otherwise categorized as non-allergic rhinitis. And a lot of uh, the literature related to that has been discussed in Europe and it is basically treated pretty similar, pretty similar to regular allergic rhinitis, but one needs nasal provocation testing to make that diagnosis. What about component resolved diagnosis, CRD? This is used to define allergen sensitization of a patient at the individual protein level by measuring specific IgE to purify natural or recombinant allergens. It potentially improves diagnostic accuracy distinguishes cross-reactivity phenomena from true co-sensitization, resolves low-risk markers uh, from high-risk markers of disease activity, and may improve the selection of allergens for allergen immunotherapy when compared to diagnosis based on skin prick test and or specific IgE determination. Uh, CRD currently remains a third-level approach and is not to be used as a screening routine uh, method. Nasal cytology. So, you know, I performed research during my career and we looked at uh, the cells that come into nose. So we use nasal cytology for research purposes and it allows you for the identification of cell types in nasal secretions and sometimes in the nasal mucosa itself if you brush or do a slightly deep uh, sweep of the nasal mucosa. Secretions are usually collected and smeared on a slide, stained and counted under the, electron, uh, the light microscope. And when assessed by nasal cytology, the predominant cell type in allergic rhinitis is the eosinophil, followed by the mast cell and the basophil. And it helps distinguish between non-allergic rhinitis and non-allergic rhinitis with eosinophilia syndrome. Uh, but it's really not commonly used in clinical practice because it's not very practical to smear and look under the microscope while the patient is waiting. Provocation testing, again, in the research arena, nasal provocation test is very frequently done. It involves applying allergies to specific organs to mimic and study the allergic response. It includes provocation of the nose and provocation of the conjunctiva. Uh, these are useful to study the pathophysiology and response to medical therapies. And uh, in addition to that, there is a environmental exposure chambers these days that have been used to mimic natural allergic reactions based on uh, blowing allergen in a chamber for a certain amount of time and recording symptoms and evaluating the efficacy of various therapies. So in a way, it is nasal provocation. Uh, and conjunctival provocation. And these tools are not commonly utilized in clinical practice and are primarily reserved for research investigations and give us a lot of information actually when used for research. So they're very, very useful. In conclusion, I hope that I've convinced you that allergic rhinitis is a prevalent disease that affects all age groups. It has a sizable negative impact on quality of life. It leads to significant healthcare expenditure. History and physical exam are critical in making the diagnosis. 
And refining the diagnosis and getting to a more definitive diagnosis can be made with either skin testing or testing for serum-specific IgE. Key points to keep in mind is it's important to evaluate the negative impact on allergic rhinitis on your quality of life of your patients. And it is important to know that history and physical exam alone may be enough to make the diagnosis when obvious, and one can initiate therapy based on just those. More specific information about specific scenarios or offending allergens will be obtained and is available to get by skin testing or serum specific tests. And finally, the less common modalities such as nasal provocation, nasal cytology, and CRD have limited value in the context of clinical disease. Suggested readings are the ICAR, ICOS statement based on allergic rhinitis published in 2018, and Dr. Weiss is the senior author. And this is an international consensus, uh, very well vetted by multiple uh, experts in the field. Uh, the treatment of seasonal allergic rhinitis uh, was published in an evidence-based focus guideline in 2017 by the American Academy and the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. And a more extensive guideline was revised and is published in 2020 in the Journal of Allergy and Clinical Immunology, again related to a practice parameter of rhinitis. And finally, the clinical practice guidelines published by the Academy and the lead author is Mike Seidman, was published in 2015 in the White Journal. These are important suggested readings to give you a broad evaluation of the disease based on evidence uh, that supports that in the literature. And finally, my sources I, are quoted in the final slide. And I thank you for your attention and hope that this is beneficial um, uh, for your time. Thank you.